RCR with Paul Brennan, Reality Check Radio. It's Friday once again. Boy, this one came around quick and on Friday mornings here at Reality Check Radio, we have our political panel. Are you ready? Here we go. I'm going to introduce our panelists again, Cam Slater. Hey, Cam, good to see you again. Good to see you again. Good morning. Olivia Pearson with your don't swear note right in front of the monitor, just just in case. Good to see you again. <laughs> good to see you too. I'm and on. Marty Gibson on. is sitting amongst what looks like, uh, listeners can't see, but wood panelling, some sort of fluffy thing next to you and a bottle right in front. What's going on <laughs> what? there? Oh, I've just uh, relaxed, getting into Friday. Yeah, fair enough. All right, yeah, I, I like the panelling. <laughs> the like panel, it's like the panelling It'll come back at panel. some point. It'll come the back sauna. into fashion at some point. It yeah. looks like um, bleached panelling. <laughs> oh, there's a business yeah. in that. That's another no, story. It's, it's just a pod, uh, pod building that uh, doesn't have kids running through it. Right. Is it a place of work, Marty? Yeah, yeah, I'm borrowing it off my wife. Okay. All right, uh, boy, uh, what a week in politics. Where do we start? It's got to be the river of filth guy. Yeah, I reckon we could start with Michael Wood. Um, oh, wait know, on. Can we award the gaslighter of the week right now? Who to? Him. Yes, well, he has been gaslighting us, saying, oh, you know, I, I, I just sort of kind of forgot about the – the shares that were there, you know, he, he sounded a lot like Father Ted when he was caught with the fundraising money for Lords in his bank account, you know, and and the and the simpleton father sits there and says, "Oh, about that money from Lords, Father Ted." He says, "Oh yes, yes, it was just resting in my account." And he says, yes, Father, it was resting there for a good long time. <laughs> so, so what we've got is um, Michael Wood. Uh, as a minister, owning shares, a, a paltry amount of shares. He sold them uh, yesterday for $16,000. We're not talking a huge amount, but it's not a good look. And initially when this story broke, I, I came out and said, well, you know, he's been a bit silly, but it's not really a sackable offence. But then we've subsequently found out that we were first told that by Chris Hipkins that he was told six times he had to divest, divest himself of those shares and then the following day, it was found, discovered in Parliament under questioning that it was actually 12 times. Um, and then in the meantime, he's also made a decision on a regional airport that would compete with Auckland International Airport, which is a direct conflict of interest. And he still hasn't sold the shares, which is a relatively simple thing to do at this point. And uh, yesterday, he we found out that he had been told by Jacinda uh, or told Jacinda Ardern's office three times that he had sold them when he hadn't. Oh. And now there's an inquiry by the pecuniary interest registrar. And then to top it all off, uh, back in 2020 and 2021, he uh, misled a newsroom journalist and they've plastered the emails all over uh, their website showing that he he said none when he had you know they asked him is there other any any other interests out there and he says none so what we've got here is the the minister who described the freedom lovers as a river of filth is actually the filth and he's been obfuscating gaslighting uh, misleading uh, over all of this. And uh, we actually can't believe a word he has to say anymore. And surely he should be sacked for this. I thought yeah. socialists weren't allowed to own shares. Well, may maybe that's why he kept hiding his, like, his dirty little secret, his little, you know, um, he bought shares when he was 18 and working at Hugh Wright's. And, you know, I, I sort of quipped about that. He'd got a, a hot tip from a share broker while um, – Michael Wood was measuring his inside seam for um for his or, set of trousers or, or walk shorts, yeah, probably for matching I socks. I, I think he was. I think he, he the when was this nineteen nineteen eighty eight or something like that. Probably yeah, be past that the, yeah, probably past the walk shorts era. Oh, he, maybe he just. writes pants cam with um special panels for pocket billiards. <laughs> <laughs> Stubbies. That's his sole um, work experience is working at Hugh Wright's measuring men's inside seams. That's like how you're being uh, served. Senior negotiator for the financial sector union, which is unionist is I think the second most uh, numerous occupation in the beehive after 
uh, former teacher. So if you ever wondered what a country run by teachers and unionists looks like, here we are. Behold. Yeah, so uh, look, it's pretty shabby. The fact that it's gone on for four days now, um, there's an old saying in politics, if something's still going after three days, you've got a real problem. And the only way you can cauterize that bleeding stump of a career of Michael Wood is actually to sack him. And even then the inquiry is still going to carry on. So they've got a, a bit more time and some more pain on this. And I wouldn't mind betting some other stuff comes out. So he's under the bus? Well, he should be. Will he be, though? Well, it's, you know, Chris Hipkins is running a huge risk now. He's looking like he's defending a, a rather murky looking and rather slippery and oily looking. And, you know, the way he does his hair and all that, you know, I know we shouldn't really criticize people for doing that, but he just looks like an oily little oik, little union bother boy. You, you don't see the oily hair look around much these days. Let's, let's be honest. But what I mean, my dad used to have hair like that. Yeah, but what, that, what, that, what there is, was a mafia look, wasn't it? With your you, uh, with your <laughs> guinea charm and your silk suits and your oily hair. Yeah, your yeah, get the brill words. cream out. But you know, this is a guy who spent a lifetime as the understudy of Phil Goff, oh, and really? he's ruined his career um, in in about three seconds flat by doggedly holding on to Auckland Airport shares for whatever reason. You know, ask 12 times. You, you can't say you forgot about it. You, know, you just can't. Mm. So it's it's shabby and uh, it's, a, it's a bad look for Hipkins. And if you, you know, there's a rule in politics, if you make the Prime Minister look, look bad, then you're finished. And uh, that's what it's looking like for Michael Wood. But I guess we'll, they want a bit more pain. So we'll just lurch on. Any more comments to make about Michael Wood? Uh, no, but, uh, well, yes, I would only say that we are living in a time where politics is so corrupt and so run by liars, and it's lying as a way of life, as, as I've said before, that the anomaly now is to actually uh, be surprised by somebody who's decent, honest, and on the level. Um because that's as rare as a unicorn. So we now expect people to lie and to have corrupt dealings, and that's very sad. That's yeah, well, right. New Zealanders are the people Plato was talking about when he said one of the penalties for refusing to po participate in politics is that you end up being governed by your inferiors. Oh, ain't that the truth? Yeah. Uh, it's a bit of... Um, have you read um, Plato's Republic? I've got it. I've flicked through it. I haven't read it. They take your children off you at seven, the boys. Could be a bit of karma working Not here. a great model. Could be a bit of karma. All right. So what's next? Well, we've got... Um, WHO. Yeah. Sean Plunkett, um, seven months ago, uh, hung up on a caller who uh, had called into the platform, you know, the, the promoted as a free speech alternative radio station. And Sean Plunkett said about... Um, demonizing people and carrying on and towing the statist uh the resistance yeah the yeah called the resistance but but in reality he's controlled um opposition and he, you know anybody who brought up anything about vaccines or about the about the who or any sort of you know this, this what he called conspiracies he just hung up on them and then you know abused them well 7 months ago he hung up on a caller who was concerned that the WHO had plans for digital vaccine passports. <laughs> and what do we find out this week? The WHO and the EU have announced a partnership creating global a global system of digital vaccine passports. Yeah. Yep. And, and so, that's, been, that's been in play for quite a while, as I understand, because it was about a year ago that the World Health Organization had contracted German-based Deutsche Telekom subsidiary T-Systems to develop a global vaccine passport system with plans to link every person on the planet to a QR code and digital ID. Wow. There is nothing conspiracy theory about it. it it's all there, isn't it? And, yeah. and, and, you know, I think Sean Plunkett is often inspired by that joke that you don't have to run faster than the bear, just your friend. I think that's his relationship with mainstream media. Yeah. Just, uh, just stays yeah. a couple of steps ahead of them. Well, not even a couple of steps, you know. It, it'd be a, a a few steps with heavy panting. 
<laughs> and that was an appalling call. I mean, that I did listen to it, and Sean, he he does this, but this is his style, and this is what make, makes him insufferable and unlistenable. Is he's so rude? He sounds like an old bitch nana on the rags, and you know he screeches and he he sound he he he's got no control. Um, he, it's nasty, but it's in a way that he thinks is somehow cool. Um, and domineering, but it's so rude. And the amount of um, good information that callers have had to him that he just overrides with that terrible um, act is, it's, I don't know how anybody could listen to the platform. There's oh, well, let's no, there's, do better. There's nothing worse than a, a pseudo intellectual proving his complete ignorance about a topic uh, and uh, cutting off callers. Um, so abruptly and deriding their actual facts that they've got as some sort of uh, a conspiracy theory. And then, you know, this is the thing we keep joking about this, you know, the difference in time between a conspiracy theory and a, and a fact. And it's, it's a matter of weeks these days, in this case, it's seven months, but this information's all out there for, you know, people who should be well-informed, who should be able to, discover this information for themselves. We've all discovered it for ourselves. Nobody mm. pushed it our way. You know, we, we discovered very quickly, you know, the benefits of things like ivermectin and the, the the abject failure of the vaccines. And we're only just discovering that now, but it's all too late for a whole lot of people, especially the dead ones. It's very late for them. Yeah, um, there's no, but, no coming back. Yeah, you know, and I always said to people, like, you that's fine. You can choose to have a vaccine, but if it goes wrong, and we've had incidences of of medicines going wrong, thalidomide, the most, I guess, catastrophic and yeah. large scale one, it's too late once you've got it in your arm. You can't unvaccinate yourself. Have you seen that poster of thalidomide with um, its uh, its uh, strap line, safe and effective? <laughs> no, I haven't. Yeah. Well, it's funny you say that, Marty. I was watching a video that was um, someone gave me a link to, and it was shot in 2005, I think, and it was a case um, regarding a vaccine injury from a, another vaccine. Now, I can't remember the full details, but they had the same line, safe and effective. Mm -hmm. The guy who was giving evidence for the um, you know, for using the vaccine, it's safe euphemism. and effective. Safe. They, they've had this line for years. Mm. Oh, tobacco new. use is safe and effective too. Remember, they oh. used to prescribe yeah. tobacco use uh, for asthmatics. Yeah, the menthols are really, really helpful for that. <laughs> yeah. Do you, so should we play? Should we play a bit of that? Of what you're talking about? That absolutely. Call? Okay, let's have a listen. Now, now people say that this is going away. What um, going away, that, Paul? Uh, Vaccine passes, and let's just live with COVID and, and forget about it. Well, it's not really going away because at the moment in Bali, the World Health Organization... Oh, for God's sake, Paul, meeting. what's this got to do with Bali? The well, World Health a, Organization are meeting in Bali. So effing yeah. what? Well, and well, how do you know that, Paul? Because you read it on the internet. Because someone in your, uh, in your stupid, moronic, bloody echo chamber sent it to you. So the World Health Organization is meeting down, in Bali. So what? You tell me. So let me tell you, they want to reintroduce the digital vaccine passport for you and I to travel around the world. So let's have a digital health certificate acknowledged by WHO if you have been vaccinated or tested properly, then you can move around. By incorporating other use such as a digitized international certificate of vaccination, routine immunization cards, and international patient summaries. They want to reintroduce a digital vaccine passport. International certificate of vaccination. For you and I to travel around the world. How do you know that? I saw the meeting. I saw, I saw it right. on the internet, Paul. Goodbye. You've just heard it, folks. Any comments to make after playing that panel? Well, just Sean Plunkett showing his absolute ignorance about a topic and ignoring the advice and warnings of a far more uh, inf well informed uh, listener. And, you know, if you deride people like that, then you're just going to quickly uh, lose 
uh, listenership, you're going to lose audience. And I but guess when that's... when did that style of interviewing and rudeness and meanness and just pig-headed stupidity become something? It's, that it's shock want... jock talkback, is what it is. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but, but, it's but that shock... era has kind of gone, and there are you know there are times and places for kind of being that way, but. I mean, he must yeah. want people to call in and offer their opinion. But why Why is anybody going to call in and be treated like that? Get beaten up. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we'll I find mean, out, right? Yeah. Maybe I'll, I'll make it, put on a voice and make a, make a call, see what happens. Hold your, hold your nose and make a call and have a mouthful of plums or something. <laughs> okay. We'll think about that one. All right. Moving on. More babies. Now, we had a guy who'd made a documentary on why the global birth rate is crashing, and it is crashing, and it's actually very serious. It is. Um, it, it results in a whole lot of problems, a universe of problems, especially for the younger people who have to support it all through their taxes, and there's less and less of them. So Luxon's on to something here. Yeah, great point. And, uh, you know, as usual, he's fallen into a bucket of tits and come up sucking his thumb. He, uh, he I think uh, Cam made the comment, um, you know, should have passed that uh, one on to Nicola Willis, and he absolutely should have because, oh, man, let's take a wager on how long it's going to take to get another handmaid's, uh, Handmaiden's Tale uh, comment mm. from, uh, you know, some childless woman, I guess. There's just some things that blokes shouldn't talk about. They should just never get into it. And he's just going to walk straight into a eugenics argument or, um, you know, there's a Christian fundamentalist um, wanting women to stay in the kitchen and produce babies. But, I mean, I guess, no, now he can add another slogan. Instead of build big better, now we've got have, have more kids. Can have you? more babies. But here's the thing. Here's the thing, and I'm going to say it. He is absolutely correct. It shocks me now, and it's very sad. It saddens me how um, women don't want babies anymore, and part of that is um, the price of everything. Babies are expensive, but it's got more to do with feminism and the unhealthy uh, narrative that feminism has had for, what, 50 years that somehow it's a lesser role being a woman at home. But um, you can talk about it if you've got a different personality than uh, Christopher Luxon, who I've said before is quite spineless, but Victor Orban in Hungary um, has been so aware of this problem that several years ago he um, is, he gives tax breaks. Basically, if you're a Hungarian woman who uh, wants to stay home and raise three to four children and consider that your life role, which is a great role for women being a full-time mother, you are exempt from tax for life in Hungary. That's how serious he is about um, bringing more children into the into well, that's what is that's what Israel does with their um, ultra orthodox, completely state subsidized, and all they do is produce you know 12, 13, 14 ch children. It's all state subsidized, and so well, good they, for them, good for them, I say. And the more babies, the better. I wish I had more children. Well, I agree probably, with you, Olivia. I agree, yeah. but as one of the There's most always room for another one. Israel, though, has got a problem. They're one of the most highly vaccinated countries in the world with the Pfizer vaccine, and um, those birth rates are going to drop uh, considerably. Well, that's the other elephant in the room when it comes to, I mean, they're the reasons why the birth rate is falling before this, but now add that layer on top. Well, and that's what Viktor Orban did not do in Hungary was mandatory vax either. So, uh, it, Is amazing. it easy to move there? Yeah. And they've yeah, got Eastern be. Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox church beauty all around you. I mean, really, mm. what's not to like? But they also they also don't have an immigration problem because he just said, right, you come across that border and you're not supposed to be here. We'll just stick the dogs on you. Yeah, he's staunch on that. So yeah, I mean that that that's leadership that actually does protect a country. You can't do that in the liberal West because you know. You, you just get hounded for being an authoritarian, but there is, there is, uh, it's not really authoritarian. It's deeply protective over your own. Well, it's culture. patriotism, isn't it? It's looking yeah. after your citizens. Citizen yeah, has to mean culture. something. Yeah. yeah. Marty. I, I got, I got really interested in this because as I was doing, reading the papers for media matters, I, I noticed incidentally a lot of women talking about the troubles it had conceiving. 
And so I, I did some research to see if I could find a single instance of Ashley Bloomfield giving a crap about it. And uh, no, not one. Didn't Wasn't worried about. And, and New Zealand's birth rates dropped from uh, 2.1 in 2010. I think in just 10 years, it dropped to 1.6. Oh, That's yeah. off a cliff. And, and I couldn't find very much about it. But I did find this comment by an obstetrician gynecologist who presumably helps women who are having fertility issues. Um, and she's a professor uh, at o University of Auckland, Dr. Michelle Wise. And this is from a couple of years ago. But her quote was, in, in response to asking, being asked about, you know, what, why New Zealand was having this problem, she replied, there's a lot of population experts and environment and climate change experts who might suggest we have a population overgrowth problem and having fewer children might not be a bad thing looking at a finite amount of resources. Yeah. How would you like to go to her with a fertility problem and expect her to fix it? She'd probably well, give you the depo vera. Well, I think uh, I read in the US there's actually a movement trying to cast any extra humans as unethical because well, of did, the did, did you hear that tucker it's carlson worse than that. sorry well, that, that tucker carlson interview uh with elon musk where he was saying he was talking to the the uh ceo of google and um he, he said look this is this a lot of this stuff you're saying ceo of google is terrible for people and the guy called him speciesist <laughs> <laughs> like my, like what Elon Musk is what he's called. Oh, gosh. So yeah, yeah, I, I remember help. Jordan Peterson did some uh, podcast with a guy that can, uh, he lives in South Africa. He's a professor of university in the university there. And uh, he calls himself an anti-natalist. Did you ever hear that? Wow. Um, their idea was that, his idea was that man had gone in his evolution beyond anything that was useful um, and had over evolved. And therefore um, <laughs> it was our moral duty to make sure that children were not born because, because of the fact we die and uh, that death is so painful for us. It would be better if we weren't born. Oh, it, was, it was shocking. What planet? Um, and, and I remember Jordan Peterson was trying to entertain the philosophical ideas for as long as he could, but eventually uh, Peterson got a bit worked up and said, where's your courage, man? Where's your courage to live? Mm. Sure, we die, but you know, there's this thing that happens in between called living, and that's what we focus on. What a life that must be. I've spoken and to people. And also, the moral imperative would be that if you really believe that, as this man did, if you really believe that, well, why don't you top yourself? Well, that's what I think about some of the Greens. Not that I want that to happen, yeah. but if, if you're worried about overpopulation and resources and everything, you're expecting someone else to do it. How if about you volunteering about the, the yourself? Of income. But it's, Give but it's some like, of your money away. It's like public transport. Everyone thinks it's a great idea for other people to use. And all these greens and that, they talk about carbon. The carbon they want to control and remove from, from, from our lives is us. Yeah, there's a yeah. self-loathing going on there. Is that what it is? Very much. Very much so. Well, I don't know if it's it, – it, I, I just wonder whether people have had – I don't know, they, they navel gaze too much to the point where – their fear of death is so strong that they can't live life. And, I mean, we all die. We've just got to accept it and get on with it. Um, well, that's part of living, is to living, understand yeah. that and cope with it. Yeah, Did you read about the mouse experiment? Have you ever heard of that? Where, where this guy made a mouse heaven for, for mice, and um, they, they basically bred and they had unlimited food. And, and eventually what happened was the, the female mice – stopped having sex, started eating or harming their babies. A group broke off called the Beautiful Ones who became homosexual. And uh, after a certain point, the last mouse was born. And uh, he replicated that experiment tens of times and got the same result. Gosh. And it's like I keep saying about Unwin's thing with civilizational collapse happening like clockwork three generations after you take the stigma off um, Premarital sex, you get that harem's form, and uh, you know. You, we, so we're seeing that way. we're seeing we're seeing that kind of experiment result playing out in front of us. Is that what you're saying right now I with think, us? I think it's foolish not to look at um, what's happened before to try and explain what's happening now. I saw um, 
Paul Spoonley uh, said it's pretty obvious why it happens. Women are, you know, having children later. It's uh, and you know, um, they, they've got careers, and it's just well, that's crap. It's uh, and as usual, there's no references or figures. Well, according to the guy we had on, uh, name escapes me. He made three parts of this documentary. He was a real serious player in understanding this. It's because one of the significant reasons is because relationships don't last long enough. Yeah, yeah it's but, as simple as that. But you look, you look, and then with the delay that you have, the relationships don't last. Suddenly, the woman is in a position where there are no options for a long-term relationship, and the age thing has conspired against you, and it's kind of checkmate. But but you have this these societal construct constructs like marriage, for example, where, um, you know, you've got people who are living longer. Like, like my grandfather died at 70. My grandmother died at 80, and that was considered really old. Well, my father's 80 now, and he's pretty sprightly, so we're living longer. And you've got people, you know, when, when they see dying, you know, till death do us part in, in the marriage vows. It was about like, 60, 65 is what they mean. You know, you died because you wanted to, Right. But but now if you're going to live to eighty or ninety and it's to death those part, you're going oh please let me go. You got another I mean, forty you know, years of this. <laughs> imagine living with someone long and they're retired longer than that, that you were living with them while they worked. Yeah, you know, at least when they worked, they went out away from the home and you got some peace and quiet during the day. But now in now they're retired and they're there for 40 more years. <laughs> you know, you'd you want certainly to... have to have a system for dealing with that. Well, that's right. But, you know. Here's a question. Everyone wants long life, longevity. You wouldn't want to live too long, would you? Even if you're in health. It well, all would become the, the I tell same. You, I learned, and... Having steered death in the face. Same. Right? Same. I... Um, I have a different perspective. Right? I was sitting there in the hospital in the emergency room thinking, wow, that was a that was a pretty close run thing there. I came pretty close to croaking. And so I changed everything about my life. And some people would say I've become more selfish, but I've actually started enjoying life a whole lot more and putting more balance into my life because it was nearly all taken away. And I didn't want to die or go out, you know, um, pegging out slowly thinking, gosh, I wish I'd done that. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, people, who, only people who have experienced that near death e experience, and you know, I'm not talking about the type where you saw the light coming, but when you're sitting there in close the hospital, shave. close shave and you're thinking, gosh, you know, things have to change. And you can go completely bonkers on that. And but you wouldn't want to live to 150 or 200. But if, you've, if you're fit and strong and you've, you know, you've got your health, yeah, why not? Okay. Yeah. Right? I mean, like, long life is a blessing if, you, like, if you're healthy and you have good family and close relationships around you, then, it, then it's beautiful. And even if you take on a, a, you know, a more fragile, well, of course you're going to become more fragile, um, it's still worth living. But, um, you know, I mean, at the moment, life itself is uh, not valued in this, well, I mean, I believe it's because we're under a depopulation agenda and they're doing everything they possibly can to, as um, uh, the guy from the World Economic Forum, what's his name, Yul uh, Harari, oh, that guy? No, that, oh, that guy. Ooh. The guy that wrote Sapiens, he also is of the view that humans have almost over-evolved and that our our best moral and uh, happiness guide is to be before farming and agrarian. Um, but there was a miserable life. But there was a miserable yeah, life where yeah, people, he's like, me, he's people basically... like me got on all right because we had the means and the wherewithal to go and hunt and kill. Well, he, that's what he's saying is that the hunter-gatherer life was sort of like the apex of proper civilization. It's so dark. It's incredibly dark. Especially that when you're teaching kids that. You know, that, that's what really annoys me is the kids who think they're going to be burning up in five years Bollocks. through climate change. Yeah. yeah. That, and, and the effect of that. Yeah. Terrible. Terrible. And, and we got to this 
from Christopher Luxon saying yeah. more babies, girls. Well, he's right. We should have yeah. more babies, but perhaps I agree one of him. the women should say it. But they're not going to because they're feminists and they're climate alarmists. So they or won't a man who makes women feel like having babies, maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have a Come on, we could just change the topic. I'm All sorry. right, Tucker, 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 and your time is uh, ticking away. Tucker, Tucker, he's um, done his first Twitter show, right? Uh, he, is this, Olivia, is this mine? That's that is you, yours. Olivia. This is your wheelhouse. Oh, um, my little wheelhouse. Well, I mean, honestly, he's phenomenal, and he's straight back on the most important things. And this is why Tucker can get seventy million views in twenty-four hours is because he talks about the big things, such as who sabotaged the Dnieper River um, Kavanovka Dam, probably the Ukrainian terrorists, although it's trying to be pinned on Russia, just like they did with the Nord Stream pipeline. Um, he also talked about the lack of media curiosity in JFK's assassination, uncomfortable 9-11 truths, um, Jeffrey Epstein and how he got so rich and how he really died. Black Lives Matter riots. Black Lives yeah. Matter riots. And, and the big one, David Grosh, who's the veteran of the National Geospatial, is a veteran of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, a whistleblower who has information about deeply covert programs that have been hidden and that are about retrieved intact and partially intact craft of non-human origin. So that's aliens. Um, Grosh's claims have come out just days after a Pentagon chief admitted that unidentified metallic orbs have been found all over the world. That's Sean uh, Kirkpatrick, director of a new um, unidentified aerial phenomena analysis office, um, said these objects are making very interesting apparent manoeuvres, as we've already seen when Tucker was on air with the Tic Tacs that were being yeah. seen by the fight of, of by the of, of San Diego, yeah. Pilots. Well, yeah. So, I mean, because Tucker is prepared to talk about these glaring big sacred cows, um, it's because of that that he can pull 70 million viewers, and there's nothing small on his talking points agenda ever. So, go Tucker. Go so, that would, that would be bigger than all of the cable news audiences put together probably in a week, wouldn't it? Well, let's just put it into perspective, right? When he was at Fox, he was the biggest show not just at Fox, but on all cable networks. And he had 5 million views each night he was on. Yeah. So he's gone to Twitter and produced a, a short video. It's only about 20 minutes. Uh, and he's got over 70 million views in 24 hours. And, and the significance of this is not that Tucker that's, Carlson. That's huge, man. I'm just thinking, I'm just processing that. No, it is. But but the significance here is that Elon Musk is destroying t traditional media right in front of their faces. Absolutely. And this will only get bigger and bigger and bigger for Twitter uh, and Elon Musk. And you're going to start pe having people consume more and more and more information via Twitter. Uh, and you're going to get millions and millions of views in, in it. And in, he's... He's woken up to a model that is going to blitz uh, all of the, you know, the billions of dollars worth of investment in CNN and all of these yeah. structural organizations that are located physically in the United States and now having a world view, um, you know, happening via the tw Twitter platform. And then if he then adds in payments, uh, a payments platform into that and payments processing, now you've got a, a whole ecosystem that will blitz Facebook, will blitz uh, Google, will blitz all of these organizations, including the mainstream media. He'll cannibalize all the advertising revenues. The arse will drop out of their markets. And organizations like NZME and stuff will just disappear. Mm. And it's, the, it's the democratizing of news as it was always envisaged to be until it was corporatized and then amalgamated into these big corporate um, behemoths that have basically uh, abrogated their responsibility as the fourth estate. And what, yeah. what Elon Musk is doing is bringing the true fourth estate back where we've got you know the, the new version of the pamphleteers rising now. Um, when it comes to Tucker, though, I'm interested in his style too because, you know, we kind of operate in that space. He actually doesn't do anything that's too out of the usual. It's just really 
normal stuff. Well, I, I don't know, Paul. I mean, it's not normal. I well, it, it's to how it, talk about JFK. Well, okay, the subjects, but just the way yeah. he does it, there's personality. Well, uh, he, the thing with the with that the people are missing too is that Tucker Carlson was deeply embedded within the traditional news media. Yeah, I think and, his father was a, 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 a in the media back in the yeah. old days. So, yeah. and, and what he's do- doing now is he's saying they're lying to you, and I'm not. They are telling you stories and conjuring up events over there to distract you from what's happening over there, and I'm not going to be silent anymore. And that's the message that he's he's giving out by taking his show to Twitter. Aren't Fox saying, though, he's broken his contract? Did I see that? Yeah, yeah, they are. So um, that was always going to happen. I think he knew that was going to happen, but they're... I bet he's got an undertaking from Elon Musk for him to fund the legal fight against them. And that's just more grist to the mill anyway, isn't it? More publicity, more views, all about eyeballs, locking them into the Twitter platform. Elon has a hell of a lot of power, though, with this scam. Exactly. Well, that's a lot of power in one place. It's a lot of power in one place. And and, and I know that people are like, oh, Elon's great, our hero, uh, standing for free speech and all the rest of it. Sure, at this point he is, but this is a guy that has a company that wants to chip your brain. So as the Zen master said, I'm sitting back going, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I'm always, I'm always we'll see. It's uh, like saw- David Seymour and his claim to be the liberty-loving freedoms you know, of speech type person, which he shuts everybody down all around him. I saw, I saw Alex we'll Jones the, the other day say, is Elon Musk the Antichrist? Oh, dear. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, I did see that too. I, I think, think that's killed like, that discussion. Yeah, all right. Well, we, do, we, we do have to move on. Um, all right. Mike Pence um, cleared of his – he had documents at home too, right? And he has been cleared of that, and, and that's all been done. Now he's running as a candidate. <laughs> he, how me. can – He's so Mr. Plain Vanilla, isn't he? Oh, look, apart from his rather unlikable, dumpy and woefully weird wife, um, he was a whip dog on January the 6th when he certified the disgustingly fraudulent election. Uh, If he had had the courage not to certify those swing states with very dodgy outcomes, he would have proven himself um, to be worthy of being hardcore presidential material, but he did the very opposite. Um, and in He's a, a public, swamp dweller. Yeah, and in a public speech recently in D.C., he whined, President Trump was wrong. I had no right to overturn the election, and his reckless words endangered my family and everyone at the Capitol that day, and I know that history will hold Donald Trump accountable. That's what he said. Um, to me, he's the Liz Cheney of male Republicans. Actually, no, that's probably Mitt Romney, but Pence is a close second to that ignoble comparison. Um, Trump will wipe him out. And actually, the VP has one job. It really only has one job, and that's to certify or to refuse to certify an election, the presidential election, if it's fraudulent. He failed. He failed to do that one job, and now he's, he's whining and he's delusional. Just, he's he's just part of the system, and he's he's part of the problem uh, there exists not only in us politics but in politics in general around around the world he's just you know been around there for so long doing almost nothing and he's he's just the establishment candidate but well, why does he think he's got a hope in hell or or do they know they don't but there's something else in it for them well they, i don't know it's like you know it, well, same goes for Chris Christie. Yeah. I mean, you know, this was a Trump apology. Yeah, he's back at it again too. Chris and Green you know, Christie. he's never he's never dodged a donut in his entire life. Uh, you know, he probably knows where all the pies are, and um, where all and, the pies and, are hidden. And, and his tailor must be loving this, thinking, "Good, good grief! I'm gonna, I'm just gonna make an absolute fortune on um, the tailoring for the." immense jackets and pants that he's going to have to you know, wear out you know, on a day-to-day basis. I mean, Chris Christie's just not credible as a 
as a politician. I don't know where these people get these ideas I from. I don't know and, where they get them from either, Cam. It's like phenomenal. Unless they're a stalking horse for someone, you know, oh, yeah. but I still don't see that working, you know. Oh, no, because you wouldn't choose him. And did you see um, his announcement when he did his announcement speech for his presidential uh, run? Um Trump pointed this out that he kept using the word small and Trump went, Trump put out a truth tweet, a, a, a tr truth doubt, as they say. How many times did Chris Christie, Christie use the word small? Does he have a psychological problem with <laughs> size? Actually, his speech was small and not very good. It rambled all over the place and nobody had a clue what he was talking about. Hard to watch, boring, and that's what you get from a failed governor who left office with a 7% approval rate and then got run out of New Hampshire. This time it won't be any different. But the, the other thing Chris Christie is, seems to have forgotten is corruption. Um, scandal that he had with, regarding the bridges and the tolls, bridges. and you know, it's just not credible. These people are clowns. But that, that's why yeah. I keep wondering why they do this. They must get some sort of payout because Chris Christie or, or Mike Pence cannot possibly believe they're going to no. be the president. No way. They've got no hope. But I mean, it, it, wait till the Democrats start lining up and we get to laugh at them. Well, Cornell West, I see, is um, a Democrat candidate and he's quite a crazy professor type so oh is he running yeah i think he's announced yeah, he's running for oh, the democratic nomination me. he 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 answers everything with now that is a powerful question and then he never answers the question <laughs> he, he, and he, sister he, and brother all the time he, he's like that character out of billions isn't he you know the 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 Which district one? attorney in in billions that's Chasing after, um, yeah, the Bobby. main character Bobby Axelrod, and he's got hair like that, and you know, just oh, I do know the one you mean. Yes, I do. He's a facsimile of him, really. Isn't he? Let's. Um, so that's Pence. Yeah, uh, maybe it's just a all just a fragment up the coverage. So you know, mm. it's all these sort of like misdirections going on. All right, we're going to have to spool through the last few very quickly. Ports of Auckland. Um, yes, well, Nati Fatua have um, have come up with a cunning plan to help Wayne Brown in his budget. And they said, instead of selling the airport, why doesn't Wayne Brown sell the ports of Auckland to them? And that will help address the theft of their land uh, without remembering that the ports of Auckland is sitting entirely on reclaimed land. Oh. <laughs> but there's nothing like a bunch of grasping people who think there's an opportunity there for them to grab hold of something. And I imagine it would be some sort of sweetheart deal that this government would be pouring money into so that they can buy the ports of Auckland. But, of course, Wayne Brown won't entertain that because he wants to move the ports of Auckland from where it is. So well, Let's if, unreclaim the land. Well, that well, that's you know, maybe we should put it back the way it was. Yeah. All and right. Then, well, just um, before we move on from that, how come Māori is so loyal to Labour when there's that huge difference in treaty claims between what National Settle and what Labour does? Is it that your your average Māori in the street, you know, doesn't see that see any of it because they, well, I mean, well, I asked this question of Corinna Jones. Um, she tweets as Auntie Hey Hey, and uh, she. Think she rang me up for some advice and we had a, a good old chat. And I said, well, how have you voted in all your years before? She said, oh, Labour. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, well, why was that? She said, well, because mum and dad did and their mum and dad did and their mum and dad did. And so what you've got is, uh, you know, inertia really. Uh, among among Maori, there's a small percentage that vote for other parties, but by and large they vote for for Labour, and there's a, a certain amount of inertia there. But I also, you know, like to liken it to Pavlov's dogs. So you know the famous experiment where Pavlov was, you know, keeping dogs chained to a table, and then when they were eventually freed from um, from their chains, they wouldn't get off the table. Because they'd so so become so accustomed to being on the table that they didn't know anything else, so they stayed on the table even though they were free to jump off and run around. And that's what I think a lot of Maori are trapped into a cycle of a inertia and b um, 
a conditioned response to vote Labour because that's what you do. Yeah, it's it's like 1.59 billion versus 277 million. You know, Helen Clark uh, settled 15, National settled 59. It's uh, and I guess it's because partly iwi trickle down makes neoliberal trickle down look like hooker falls. Right? Hooker falls, right? Yeah. Um, it, there's there's not a lot going to uh, to give the cuzzies new tinnies or anything like that. No, there's, that's the problem, you see. And that's where I said to Corinna Jones, well, why are you thinking of changing now? And she said, well, because um, we're treated like um, we're expected to vote for them and they just treat us like scum. And, I, I mean, I've said this for years and years and years. I just can't, I can't understand it. And not for the life of me, I cannot work out why National even bothers to stand candidates in Maori seats. Uh, and you know they they've done that under Luxon with his woke project. They've they've got candidates in Maori seats. Oh, I'll tell you what, there'll be less than ten thousand votes for National in those Maori seats across all of them combined. And it's just a complete waste of time. And, and you know this is why I still can't understand why Luxon contains all of this rubbish because he should just come so come out and say, well, the statistics and the votes show that Maori don't vote for us, so we're clearly not the party that they want to vote for, so we're not going to even entertain anything for them. And he'd get a lot more support if he did that, but he won't because he's so woke. Well, he disconnected from the Maori party, didn't he? He said... Well, no they are there. vastly they're different. different. They're vastly different. Yeah, but the, he actually Maori declared it publicly. Of, yeah, of Tari Anaturi and Peter Sharples, who actually acted with integrity. And um, the clowns that are in there now are just hmm. are actually unmitigated racists. All right, um, let's um, wind things up with this now. Jan Tanetti before Privileges Committee. Oh, I'm Did you watch it? I watched, I, I watched it yesterday. And, uh, you know, talk about uh, pathetic you know, coming up with these excuses as to why, you know, oh, no, it was just a coincidence. Oh, oh, no, I'm deeply sorry for misleading on that and just cringing for over an hour before finally the chairman of the uh, Privileges Committee uh, wound it up. And, you know, it was uh, David Parker, and um, he shut down uh, the National Party questioners I think it's a foregone conclusion. She may get a cent, you know, she may get, um, you know, some sort of slap on the wrist with a wet bus ticket. Um, if only we had wet bus tickets these days, they're all sort of hop cards and things like that. Aren't it's they? all digital. It's going digital. Can't even give her a paper cut with it. Um, you know, it's it's it just <clears throat> shows, though, the dishonesty and the disingenuous nature of these Labour ministers where they want to hide, obfuscate, uh, outright lie in some instances um, in order to prevent uh, the reality of their appalling policies coming to the fore through things like the Official Information Act um, and other means. And it, it just shows, again, the inherent dishonesty of the Labour government. All right. Anyone else got anything to say about that? Because I do want to mention this because I think it's something that we should know. Fiji has almost the same number of soldiers as we do, and there are holes in the hulls of our frigates. They've just come back from Canada being refitted. We paid huge money for that, and they've got holes. What's going on there? Who found I've, that out? You know, I've got a few sources around the place and uh, got contacted last week about the frigates and the situation with the frigates. Takaha is essentially non-operational despite a, a refit of the engines. and um, They've got you know um, arm-sized holes in the hull. Uh, they're busily trying to keep it quiet. Um, also, on the way back from Canada, they, they had what's called in the Navy a rub against a Chinese warship. Oh. Um, they've kept that very quiet. But, you know, um, on Wednesday, um, Chris Hipkins announced that uh, they're signing a defence pact of some sort with Fiji. And I just laughed and laughed and laughed because I was leaked some documents that shows that uh, the New Zealand Army... Uh, is hemorrhaging staff uh, so fast, you know, in, in the order of um, hundreds and hundreds of soldiers a, a year, uh, hemorrhaging out the out the back of the army. They're demoralised, and I guess this is what happens when you hire the army to be your little henchman. 
But the one of the leaked slides that I had from the Ministry of Defence shows that the attrition over the years and the investment and experience that's lost. For example, in 2019, there was 501 soldiers that left. The experience lost was measured in, as 2,879 years for a total investment of $269.9 million. And if you look at 2022, just last year, 793 soldiers left, uh, experience of lost years of 5,250, and a staggering half a billion dollars of investment in the training of those soldiers. Wow. Gone up in smoke. You know, we're not even, you know, it's considered normal to spend 2% of your GDP on on defence. We're not even anywhere near that. We're a tenth of that. We might as well pack it up. And well, so, so have we done that, Cam, over the years? Um, because uh, we're, jo- John, we're bludgers. Yeah, well, and also, but also, well, bludging off whom, though? United but, States, but it, Australia, anybody yeah, but, who's got more than us. Well, we yeah. also had a prime minister in Goff who spat at Vietnam vets. So, you know, you can't expect him to. Yeah. yeah. But, but, it, but you know, also it's like, it's, it's like this cosy relationship with China. China. Um, that, yeah, as Trump would say, China. China. But The only uh, time I've ever seen Jacinda Ardern run was when someone asked her a question about Hong Kong and, and just sprinted and, away from the lectern. It was incredible. But it's almost as if they've sold out our military already. And um, our, our military is dysfunctional, right? Uh, if you look on paper, we're supposed to have several battalions of soldiers, right? And we've signed this defence agreement with Fiji. Well, here's some facts. The Fiji military has 4,040 active personnel, right, for a population of just under a million. And the New Zealand Army has a regular force size of 4,519. So we've got a population of over 5 million. So does that mean Fiji could invade us and take us over? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you know, famously David Long, he called in the Defence Force when the coup happened in 1987 and said, right, I want to plan to invade Fiji and to um, stop the the, the take out the coup people, um, destroy their army and... um, and, and put in place a, an interim government. And the New Zealand Defence Force back then, which was a lot larger in 1987, the guy laughed at Longy and he said, we, we wouldn't even get off the beach. Yeah. Right? We don't have the ability to transport. And so, you know, Longy said, well, why don't we just fly up some some soldiers in our, um, in our Hercules and land them in Suva and, and then take over that? Well, Like in the movies. Yeah, except a, a fully kitted out um, set of infantry on a on a Hercules, you can carry about sixty soldiers, and we've got three Hercules, and so we'd have a total of one hundred and eighty soldiers landing at, at the place where Fiji has the most of their military, right, with the Victoria Barracks, and we'd have one hundred and eighty soldiers that would then be left there with only the supplies that came in on those planes for a minimum of eight hours before the next lot could come yeah. in, right? Mm-hmm. And they're all done by, right? by the so time you get the next lot in, they've, they're all, those have been They're all out. gone, yeah. right? So we don't have the ability to project power. We we don't have the ability to... Does, no. to we don't have the ability to take soldiers anywhere and get them off a ship onto the beach. And so we actually, when I say we're bludgers, we are bludgers, defence bludgers, we're expecting the United States, Great Britain, Canada, and Australia to fill the void that we don't. And, you know, they point to things like, you know, five eyes. Well, we're a flea compared to the yeah. investment of all of those other countries. And, you know, I was doing some work in, in Southeast Asia, you know, for, for a government organisation, and I was told if, it, if all things go to hell and, and you need to get some uh, consular support or anything – don't go to the New Zealand emb- embassy. Go to the Canadians. Right? The British won't want to know you. The Americans will ignore you. The Australians don't care. But the um, but the Canadians are part of the Commonwealth and they'll look after you. And that was an advice from somebody in the government at the time. 
But sooner or later, New Zealand's going to have to make up its mind whether to ally properly with the UK, the US and Australia or just drift into some kind of an alliance with China. Um, It's very hard to separate our trade from our military alliances when trades run so deep. We Um, can't even protect our economic zone. We've got two frigates when we should have four. We can't even crew two frigates. We don't have enough crews from my, this is what my Navy sources are telling me. We don't have enough crews to, to have two frigates operational at any one time. It is a joke. We got uh, those uh, new um, um, patrol planes. Well, we though, sold the, some the, of them. The P eight Poseidons. They're pretty cool. Yeah, they I mean, do a lot. But, but why did we like, buy those? Why did we buy those? They, is that like a well, they drop torpedoes? Well, it's so do like a whole lot of other sabotage, things. Though I mean, this whole thing where we just we just end up as being this lovely jewel that's just a sitting duck in the South Pacific, without a military alliance. I mean, interesting that you use the word bludgeon cam. Um, that, you know, in, in order for any protection military around us, we would have to bludge off other countries. We would. We would. Yeah, but, no, but, I, can, I can see that. But this is what you get when you go into alliances that are deep in trade, which are so meaningful to us and so unmeaningful to China, as in a blip on their radar. Um, and and you, you couple up with um, brutal communists. Um, and now, I mean, Australia is on high alert with um, Absolutely. China and their aggression, and we would have to choose. We would have to choose sooner or later. Well, we wouldn't choose, but we would just surrender. The, the quickest way to end a war is to lose it, as George Orwell said. I often use that philosophy in my parenting, and apparently the New Zealand military is quite fond of it as well. Well, there's that old old, old movie in 1959, the, the Mouse That Roared, famous movie where the small little country declares war on the United States and then surrenders, hoping that they'd um, take it over and, and you know, so, save the whole country. <laughs> and, of course, it turned try into, that. <laughs> into a great satire, um, the move, but it was the mouse that roared, and that's literally what New Zealand is. We're the mouse that roared. Didn't the uh, Wagner Group guy, I forget his name, Prigozhin or something, didn't he have a map? There was a video of him last week with a map of the world behind his desk. He was talking, and there were red pins in the Channel <laughs> Islands. Well, he's probably got more ability to get a whole bunch of Wagner mercenaries to the um, Chatham Islands before the New Zealand Defence Horse could get, could get an inflatable boat off a ship. <laughs> All right. Well, another political panel there. We'll it's do it again very next sad Friday. It's state of affairs, isn't it? Oh, and it's, uh, it's good to know that we're defenceless as we go get into bed tonight and <laughs> no one can come and save us. We, we could have Dad's army. Well, we're, huh? We've got no guns either, so... Yeah, well, we, we could borrow cams. Yeah, well, where the workshop could uh, work on some, you know, good-looking yeah, fakes. I, my, my, my mates at the Antique Arms in Auckland have probably got more guns than the New Zealand Army. All right. Well, thanks, folks. Cam Slater, Olivia Pearson, and Marty Gibson for another one. We'll do it again next Friday. Have a great week, guys, or a great weekend and a great week. Thanks. Cheers, much. Paul. Thank you. RCR with Paul Brennan. Reality Check Radio.